So um, I want to get your take on Black Lives Matter. Mm -hmm. uh, you wrote your second piece in commentary is about that. But in, in commentary, you really talk about Black Lives Matter's view on other issues other than what they were founded for. So, let, but let's start with with the shootings. So let me just let me just say this to those who are listening, particularly in YouTube. If you want to ask a question, uh, the super chat is available. So uh, you know how to use the super chat. And if you want to ask a question of, uh, of Jason, feel free to use uh, use it through the super chat. So the whole police shooting phenomena, the the rise of Black Lives Matter. Uh, you know, how do you how do you see that? And then I want to talk more about the the broader agenda of Black Lives Matter. Well, I thought that the the initially I thought that I, the Black Lives Matter movement was a legitimate movement, which I supported in the fact that it had a singular, a very singular aim, which was to draw attention to the shooting of unarmed black men in this country that needed to be addressed. I thought that this was coming from, these shootings were coming from two sources. There have always been rogue cops um, or trigger happy cops in law enforcement. Yep. And there are policemen who are simply weighed down by what I call statistical reasoning, which is a which is horrible. But the fact that blacks constitute eleven percent of the population, but black men commit a disproportionate number of crimes in this country is an unfortunate thing. But it has to be admitted. And I have a number of police officers, at least two or three, who are friends, who admit to this what form of what they call statistical reasoning. And that when you are in a very tense situation, um, this form of statistical reasoning uh, overtakes or supersedes your rational judgment quite often when you're so bombarded with stimuli that your judgment fails you. Nevertheless, law enforcement um, has a coercive monopoly on the use of force yeah. and has more of a, a, a moral obligation to exercise uh, rash, rational judgment, no matter how um, challenging those situations are. So I thought Black Lives Matter was strategically calling attention to this problem. They quickly lost their moral credibility for me. Very quickly, yeah. Very quickly, because then, first of all, they started attacking um, Israel as a, and I'm a radical in the book, you know, I have a chapter on it, a section on Israel where I radically defend Israel. Uh, they started attacking Israel as a genocidal apartheid state. So when did this happen? Because I, I was not aware of the Israel stuff. So for me, the, I, I, the, the thing that tipped me on Black Lives Matter is I remember the demonstrations in Chicago, actually. Mm -hmm. and instead of demonstrating in front of City Hall or in front of the police stations where, you know, you would think uh, have the responsibility for the trigger happy cops or, or whatever, they were on Michigan Avenue blocking people from entering stores and carrying socialist and Marxist plaques that had right. nothing to do with police shootings. And that's when I got that this went beyond that, because if you're concerned about police shootings, you have to demonstrate to the state. You're not demonstrating private businesses. You're not demonstrating just people walking on the street. You, 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 you're accusing the state of abusing its power. Go after state officials. Go, go, demonstrate to the mayor, the, the chief of police, go go after them. But that's not what they did. That's not what they did. That's, that's very indicative of, of a much bigger, so a more corrupt social agenda. That's right. So they stripped completely from their lane, advocated the breaking up of U.S. banks, yep. uh, adopted a, a, a cultural Marxist perspective. Um, some of them adopted an outright communist perspective. I read the manifesto very carefully before I wrote the article, and it was horrendous. Um, so when, just, did, when did you notice this Israel stuff? I'm curious, when did this enter into the jargon? Was it from the beginning? I don't think it was from the beginning. I think it came in tandem with the, the Marxist stuff, the, the breaking up of U.S. banks, because for them, capitalism and this notion of, you know, a Jewish takeover are yep. both inextricably linked. Yep. Yep. So well, it, was, it was to some extent in Marx's mind. I mean, if you read Marx's uh, essay on on the Jewish question. He has an essay called On the Jewish Question. He talks about the problem of the world is that Jews are self-interested and therefore capitalist. And the problem is the Christians have become Jewish in that they've adopted self-interest in capitalism. Right. We need to eliminate Jewishness from the world, which means we need to eliminate self-interest in capitalism from the world. So he made that link directly 
between the Jews and the capitalist and 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 self-interest in right. Um, and you know they're just they're just they're just adopting the the Marxist rhetoric. So my position, really, and I and and I state this in the book, we have overcome is that that Black Lives Matter should have been turning. Um, the movement should have been turning its signs towards the black community, making strategic alliances with police, law enforcement officers to reestablish trust with the black community, because we cannot do without law enforcement. Sure. And two, to be facing these gang members, these thugs, head on. You know, they have a moral voice. They have some sort of credibility. Mm -hmm facing these gang members that are wreaking havoc, for example, in Chicago, where we have up to 60 to 75 shootings and killings a week, which go, they all go unreported because it's, it's common. It's so common nowadays. Yeah. Instead of turning, instead of march, and some of them are marching into Jewish neighborhoods, instead of turning your signs towards white people and towards the white community, why not go into the black community now and hold some of these gang members accountable? Talk to these people, try to rebuild the community from within. Instead, it's almost as if they expect white lives to care about black lives more than black people should care about their own lives. Yeah, I mean, there's something in me that dislikes the whole conversation in the sense that individuals should value individual lives. I mean, who cares, right? Who cares, exactly, individual that, that lives. That would be a great message. Let's be colorblind when it comes to these things, and, but let's go to the criminals whatever color skin they happen to have, and let's, let's attack them. And I do think they had a claim against the police, but the claim against the police was, we need better training. We need, I mean, I, I think there are programs, some police forces have anti-bias training to deal with the statistical issues that you raised and, and things like that. That should have been the message, more education, yes. more training, and then try to use their moral credibility to bridge the gap within uh, these communities to to address to address the gang violence. That's right. That's Not right. where they went. And they also started advocating things like free education for all blacks. And I wondered, well, is now what they're getting now? Oh, this is part of this is part of their their part of their manifesto actually. Free education for all blacks. So, so this is this is college education. You mean college education? Yes. Okay, because right now they're getting they're getting uh, government education at the lower levels, and uh, the quality is pathetic and uh and and uh you know it's, it's i mean that's probably the one of the biggest problems is public education in these cities is i mean in inner city chicago the public education system is so corrupt and so horrific it's, so horrific. it's, it's a wonder how anybody escapes poverty in chicago that's right and i think what i raised in the article and i raised it in the book also is a philosophical question of whether people should be responsible for the procreational choices or the reproductive choices that other people make, which is the heart of what they're asking. Yep. Uh, and of course, I think the answer is no, right? You, you bring a child into the world, so, uh, you cannot, in Rand's sense, you cannot ask that, that to be a, a, a collectivized social good for the rest of society, right? It's, 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 it's a value that you brought into the world. Your responsibility. And it's your responsibility. So, so they, when you say in the article, you talk about the fact that Black Lives Matter is wrong on crime. What do you mean? Uh, what I mean is that they, it's more like they're dishonest on crime. Okay. Because they're not really admitting, they're following the Ta-Nehisi Coates line of argument in the sense that they're not really admitting to the real problem of black on black crime in this country and that there needs to be a real honest conversation about the fact that it is not whites that are killing blacks in disproportionate numbers in this country. White people are not marching in droves into black communities and killing other black people. It is these black, predominantly these black gang members and other blacks that are killing blacks. But when you read the manifesto and you listen to the Black Lives Matters uh, advocates, you walk away with an impression that it took, well, two things, either implicitly that white people are somehow killing black people. That's not the main message, but that's the implicit message. Or B, that black on black crime is causally related to systemic racism 
yep. and 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 the legacy of Jim Crowism in this country. And that's what Tennessee that's that's Tennessee's claim, right? That's right. And I think that's a bunch of malarkey. <laughs>